Hey there, Dave Politis, k Missing Project, a copyrighted edition for our video channel. Huck Productions. Huck's doing good today. She's happy. She's running around like a wild girl. We had her out in the snow earlier, about four feet deep up to her chest. She was having so much fun. We were freezing, but she was doing good. Okay, executive producer offset. Back to the storyline here. Yes, this is a missing persons video. And I am Dave Politis. can am Missing Project, copyrighted edition for our channel. And before we get into the missing person stuff today, I want to talk to you about a few housekeeping issues. First of all, missing 411, the UFO connection. Friends, I, want, I really want you to go and read the uh, reviews on iTunes, Amazon, etc. And uh, if you still don't think it's worth watching, then I really can't help. But if you have watched the film, if you have watched it, please go give a review. The reviews help us a lot. And even the videos here that are uh, on our channel, they're very, very enlightening. I've had very, very, very few negative comments. Actually, there's a couple on Amazon that I just laugh at. I mean, it's like the people didn't even watch it. What can I say? But you can watch it online, or you can buy the DVD and the Blu-ray from me. Buy the DVD and the Blu-ray from this address here, and uh, the other address. You can freeze this, take a screenshot, pause it, copy down where you can watch it online right now. And two other things. In September of 2023, I'm going to be doing what's called the Alaska Bigfoot Cruise. Myself and Jeff Meldrum are going to be the main speakers on it. But it goes for seven days. It's going to be a blast. And uh, if you've been taking my online Bigfoot class, you're going to be a well-instructed student with a lot of information going into that cruise. So that will be outstanding. And uh, there are some deals going on right now. And if you uh, book early, you're going to get a great price. So, and the last thing, if you're anywhere in the Midwest, anywhere around Denver, a couple states away, you got to get there the, uh, in January, January 12th, 13th, and 14th in Golden, Colorado. If you go to the Sasquatch Outpost, it's going to be uh, me and you in an auditorium. I'm going to be showing my movie, and then we're going to have a Q&A, and we'll just sit around and talk about it. In a big auditorium, it's going to be a lot of fun. Go to the SasquatchOutpost.com under the events section. Friday is a meet and greet with uh, myself, Harvey Pratt, and a few others. And then Saturday is the conference, and uh, there's going to be some good stuff there. And you'll get to meet one of the nicest people in the world, Harvey Pratt. So... And of course, I'll be around, and you'll be around. It, it'll be a good time. So, enough of the housekeeping. One other thing I want to say is that if you look at the number one comment under your video screen, first of all, I encourage everyone to read all the comments, but the number one comment is usually always mine. And in that comment, I'll talk about the video, and below it is a categorized list of the video's 400 plus that I've done. And if you're looking for a specific category to watch, please do. The more minutes you're watching our channel, the more it helps us. And then the more you post our videos on Facebook, Twitter, etc., the more it helps. I mean, believe me, it helps. And make sure you're subscribed to the channel. I had somebody comment the other day that they have been unsubscribed six times. What is that other than censorship? So, I get pretty frustrated. And now, let's talk about this segment on missing people. Let's get to the letters first of all, because they're pretty good. Hey Dave, I'm writing you out of Sioux Falls, South Dakota. I actually just wrote to you recently. I must say I'm in awe of the Missing 411 UFO Connection. It is a great documentary. 
I finally sat down a couple of nights ago and watched the documentary. I know I'll be watching the second and third time as well. There is so much content, I'm speechless. I went to bed last night thinking of all the information. It really is a rabbit hole of information linking the missing 411 cases and the UFO sightings. Wow. The interview you did with John D'Souza at the end of the documentary was amazing and very revealing. Stop there for a sec. So John is a retired FBI agent that we interviewed for the movie. And we talked about multi-dimensions, portals, etc. And I was with him for two and a half, three hours in his house. And we talked the whole time. And uh, a significant portion of that interview is on the extra portion of the DVD and Blu-ray. And I can tell you that I've had comments from people saying it is the most amazing interview they've ever seen. So I've done some uh, research on the fake alien invasion scenario. I believe it is called Project Blue Beam. The government and the cabal have to use fear to control the masses. I'm tired of the deep state's dark ways. Thank you, Dave, for shining a light on all of this. Thank you for your efforts on this documentary. Your tribute to Ben was very touching. This is an excellent documentary. Thank you again. The truth is out there. Thank you. Yes, at the end of the movie, I do a tribute to Angie and Ben. Without those two, I wouldn't be here. And I, I, I'm very grateful. Next letter. Hey, Dave. Awesome documentary. I've seen it five times now. That said, I may have found a possible connection to the German elk hunter UFO encounter. Let's stop here for a sec. So as a, as a purely amateur filmmaker, to think that anybody wants to watch something I've done a couple of times, wow, thank you. To think that there was enough in there to watch it five times, thank you five times. And that's probably the greatest pat on the back you could give me. I appreciate that. That and a review. March 23rd, 2022, I sent you an email about missing German hikers you discussed in a past video. I believe may have been abducted and sent to a secret polar hideout, possibly still in existence today. Well, according to the latest Pentagon UFO report released, one of the bullet points they addressed was the UFO technology could have been developed by a non-government clandestine group of people. Dave, if this non-government clandestine group originated from Nazi Germany, Rumors persist that the Nazi Germans contacted ETs for help designing flying saucers by 1945 and escaped to one of those polar hideouts in Antarctica where their ufology, UF technology could flourish. If this secretive group went unchallenged, there's no telling how far advanced their UFO technology has become with ET help and where they're hiding out today. The Ogallala Aquifer, perhaps? So it makes sense to me now, they would want to abduct their own kin, such as German elk hunters, to advance their own agenda. What disturbs me the most, however, is they have a total disregard for the abductee's well-being and mental state by dropping them back down to earth, not caring about if they live or die. I'm sorry, but to me, this is just plain sinister. Case in point, Carl Higdon, if the aliens are here to help out humanity, like some people believe, then they would have shown empathy and gentle set Carl down on the surface, which they didn't do. So I think that some people believe that if there's another intelligent empath entity, that they have a caring and social and empathetic side like some of us do. I think that's insane. And why do I say that? Because we can't compare us to others because you don't know what the others are like. What if they're a combination of robot and human? What if they have some genetics, just like I talked about in the Bigfoot class the other day, that are half human? And then what if the other side isn't even genetics at all? What if it's all robotics or electronics? We want to believe that there's a caring side out there, but there's nothing to say there is. When Carl was dropped back on Earth, 
What if they just looked at it like I tried to lay out at the beginning of the film? We're this ant farm. And as long as we're needed, we're treated well. And then once we're not needed, we're disposable. And they disposed of Carl. Well, luckily he lived. But how many cases have I told you about where people didn't live? Think about it. Next letter. First, I need to thank and congratulate you on completing another great documentary. I was so very disappointed I could not attend the premiere. It was sold out by the time I had made arrangements. I've been following your work for several years, so I'm familiar with the quality and content of what you produce. As the last credit was rolling, the first comment my husband made was, quote, very well done. He is a tough critic, so this is a five-star review. Several of the cases you have covered have occurred in places I'd like to hike. Mesa Verde, Colorado, Buckeye, Arizona, Taos, and Santa Fe, New Mexico. My mother's family knew the family of the lady that went missing in Meeker, Colorado in 52. They lived about 80 miles away on another ranch. I believe it is all the more reason we should know and be informed of what's going on around us. I cannot express how much I appreciate you talking about making depression a non-taboo topic. The grief of my brother's death in 2019 gripped me so hard I felt I may never breathe again. Then depression followed. Thank you, Dave, for showing up and being you each and every day. When you are sharing your vulnerability and emotions, you're building strength and bonds that will withstand all challenges and teachings. Us, we can do the same. We are not separate from the success or suffering of others. Amen. So recently having a conversation with someone really close to me. And their, their awareness about how much Ben's life and death affected me, their awareness was almost non-existent. And I don't blame them. Because as I've talked about before, your depression is yours. And many people believe they don't want to even be around it. It's like catching something. It's like once they're immersed in it, they have to dig their way out so they don't ever want to get involved. I've told you all before that when I was in counseling and the counselor said, you need to talk to your friends, Dave. And and I asked certain friends to call. They said, oh yeah, yeah, we'll do it, we'll do it. They wouldn't call. They're still my friends. But I definitely looked at them differently. Because you see, I know people that have suffered huge loss. And I've been one of those people that stuck myself out there. Tried to help them the best I could. But when I say your depression is yours, you own it. You have to find a deal, way to deal with it. Whether that's through counseling, as a group, counseling on your own, one-on-one -on -one with a counselor, reading books on the topic, that helped me. But it's not going to go away. I think some people believe, well, Dave, you got to just be able to get over it. I wish I could. I truly wish I could. Okay, next letter. Just a note to let you know that I watched Missing 411 The UFO Connection on Prime. I thoroughly enjoyed it and left a review for you. Oh, well, thank you very much. I would like to tell a story here. It may be unbelievable, but I was reminded of it after I saw a portion of his film where witnesses saw the elk lifted off the ground and taken away. For the people who yet, have yet to see the movie, group of people working on the side of a mountain for a big company see a UFO fly into a valley over a group of elk, sits down over one elk, picks it up and takes it. So witnessed by quite a few people. 
was in Washington. It's a very compelling story. And I interviewed the investigators that worked that case. And they told me that the people that witnessed the elk being taken actually were afraid that that thing would come back for them. Key point. This is a true story, Dave, and if you would like to ask my husband about this, we still talk about it today regarding what happened. Around 84 or so, my husband, myself, and a friend of ours were scuba diving at a wreck called the Cape Kelly, 57 feet deep off Racine, Wisconsin, in Lake Michigan. We're out there at sunup. The day was crystal clear, sunny, no clouds, no noise at all, and the lake was flat, calm. I love diving on conditions like that. Yes, I've been a scuba diver since I was 12. To the point where there was not a ripple on the surface of the lake. We were super happy not fighting wave action, but it is a very rare occurrence to be so flat. No one was around, and we were the only ones out there along with thousands of black flies that had landed on our boat when we anchored. They were not flying or buzzing around, just covered the white boat. Oh, that's, that's weird. Boat was 26 foot, feet, uh, 26 foot, 1956 steel crafters, all steel. It weighed a lot. We tied our boat to the wreck below. And to do that, someone takes our 300 foot anchor line down to the wreck, wraps the line through a portion of the wreck, then brings the end back up to the boat. So we have both ends of the rope looped and tied onto our boat cleat off the bow. When we leave, we untie one end and bring the rope up, sliding through the shipwreck piece. This ensures that we don't get an anchor stuck in the wreck and lose it, because we only have a certain amount of time underwater. I know you're our diver and understand this. We just can't go back down and get an anchor. So I stayed on the boat as a safety diver, and our friend and my husband went down to the wreck searching after securing the anchor. About 45 minutes later, they came up and we had lunch on the back of the boat, which was open. No covering. The water was still flat calm, and I was way in the back and at an, at an angle where I could see the anchor rope go down into the water. I was noticing how the calm water was and seeing how far down into the water I could see our white anchor rope. We were very quiet just eating our sandwiches. All of a sudden, the boat began to lift into the air. I kid you not, the entire boat. We all looked at each other like, what? It was not real slow doing this. I turned back and looked at the anchor line wondering if it was a swell. Nope. I watched as the anchor line got tighter to the point that it could not go any tighter. I looked over the side and saw the boat hole was just touching the water. I could see the straight water line mark on the side of the boat. There were no ripples in the water and the boat was level. Not where any part of the boat was higher than the other while moving upward. Then the boat stayed there very still for about five seconds. We didn't move and it did not feel like the boat swayed at all. It was like staring at the hull of our boat, not quite out of the water, but very close. Then looked at the tight anchor line again. I could see it. Then the boat went back down in the water. I watched the anchor line go slack and saw ripples in the water from the boat descending into the water. Like if you tossed a stone into a pond. The boat did not drop. It was put back down faster than the lifting part, but not roughly. We all looked at each other questioningly and asked each other, did you see that? Did you feel that? All of us said, yes, indeed. We still talk about it today. No one really believes the story, but we do. I'm told it was a swell. Nope. It, it was you guys in the boat moving. Nope. The boat just moved position. Nope. The wind. Nope. At the time, I never looked upwards to the sky, nor out very far on the horizon. I wish I did. I was not frightened at all. My thought is, if this, my thought is this after seeing your elk portion of the movie. I believe the guy's really telling the truth. Oh, it wasn't one guy, it was a whole group of workers. I wonder, since we were tied to the wreck below, if we couldn't get snatched up. We're in a boat. Maybe a UFO can't pick up someone in a vehicle of sorts or something over a certain weight or attached to earth or something. 
Maybe the steel boat was too heavy. If you dive this wreck, you cannot see shore. You have to have a compass to get back to shore. There was no other boat around. My German heritage, and at the time in super shape and mechanical aptitude, my husband is 100% full Swede, and at the time in super shape and an expert in the old school tool and die trade, our friend is German heritage, worked with the Department of Natural Resources, figuring out rotating crops for farmers. He was exceptionally, exceptionally strong and big build. I wonder today, after watching your show, were we saved by looping our anchor line around a piece of shipwreck? I do not have an answer. I believe these things are taking people away and would agree dropping them somewhere. If we did get taken and my steel boat dropped, it would have immediately sunk to the bottom. Maybe these things can't take you out of something you are in. They need to take all of it with and sort you out. You can use anything you would like here, and if not, thank you for listening. Thank you very much for what you are doing. You are changing the viewpoint of the world and making people think. And that is a great thing. Let's all have a wonderful and prosperous new year. Thanks for that story. Now, when I read that, there are a couple of things that came to mind. First of all, the Great Lakes are known for some really, really mysterious things happening. So let's pretend that that boat that they were in didn't have an anchor line. And that thing picked them up. And let's say it picked them up to 100 feet into the air and then just dropped them. Well, that boat's going to go down and it's going to sink on the bottom. And it's not going to have any obvious signs of damage, per se, that made it sink. There's been a lot of mysterious sinkings in the Bermuda Triangle. So think about that. And then the idea that the boat was perfectly flat indicates to me that something with a flat area on it was under it picking it up. Obviously, if it was a, there are no huge whale size uh, mammals, fish in the Great Lakes, none that, not huge enough to pick up a boat like that. So, really, you have to start to think that it had to have been something man made to do that. It's a fascinating story. I wrote back to them. I haven't heard back, but I hope I do. I had some questions for them about it. Hey, Dave, I hope you and your family have a blessed Christmas. Salutations to the village. I hope you guys had a great holiday season as well. My only bad comment, I have your new movie is that I wanted more. I can't wait to see where you are led next in your journey. I'm also enjoying the Sasquatch classes. A lot of people have stated, Dave, why didn't you make it long enough? Well, when you're working with a distributor of films and you know the films are gonna be on Amazon, iTunes, etc., it's gotta fit their format, their time slots. Yeah, I, could, I wish I, I would have made it two hours if I could have, but I just can't. There's like this specific time frame that it has to fit in this little niche. It could be a, you know, five minutes longer than it was. That wouldn't have been a problem, but I hear you. I hear you. The only, uh, okay, I have a far-reaching theory about Skinwalker Ranch and some other incidents that you have brought to light. You don't dig in Skinwalker Ranch without negative consequences. Could a main source of time travel, possibly some type of mechanism, be under the ranch placed by future humans or aliens? or that we cannot yet handle responsibility for us, we are not yet enlightened in the ways necessary to do so, especially in a humanitarian aspect. It may explain the preemptive maneuvers that prohibit any discernible information that we are aware of. Skip over to Wyoming, the well that was prescribed to be dug to keep water available during a cataclysmic event. What do they know of our future? Enough to know that we are on a slippery slope on this planet? Are they spiriting away people to another planet to keep the human race intact? Returning a man who was unable to produce is intriguing to me for this theory. Why monitor elk? Could this be, could this viral class and its apparent jump to multiple species just be the beginning of a catastrophic decim decimation of all mammals? Have they been 
monitoring cow herds at Skinwalker Ranch over the years for signs of viral classification that causes mad cow and muscle wasting disease. Are they attempting to thwart it? Have they stopped other planet threatening events and are reseeding planets because they haven't seen or been successful in stopping the virus? Obviously the prayer is that overall they are for us and not against us. I could go on, but I'm sure you see my line of thinking and battling. Fascinating topic. But I need you to be a critical thinker. If we go back to we're this planet and we're seeds and this planet was seeded with us and it's a long-term research project about socialization, about living, about how we handle threats, how we handle stress, how we intermingle as humans, etc. What if they are monitoring our food sources? There's a lot of evidence that mutilated cows and, and other mutilated animals have been taken away and mutilated not at the site they were seen and nothing was seen taking them. So the implication is at least in some of the instances it's alien oriented oriented but whatever. <laughs> and then you have the elk. I think it's fascinating that the elk were taken from an area in the movie where there's chronic wasting disease. And then you couple that with what the supposed aliens told Carl on the craft. I mean, the connection and the points to points there are there. And no one's ever done that before. No one's ever put it together like this. So, you could claim everyone's a liar, but the research on the elk that was taken in Washington, that's fact. People said it, they found an elk, it's in an area of chronic wasting disease. At the time Carl was abducted, nobody really knew about chronic wasting disease in that area of Wyoming. Next letter. Hey Dave, I watched your third movie for the third time. Why, thank you. What an insightful and exhaustive analysis as you continue to keep us locked on and focused with this specific profile, with the specific criteria of the missing. Congratulations. One of the things that really impressed me with this movie was your use of overhead maps of the disappearances. Dave, you also did a very good and beautiful job using this method in your second movie on the missing hunters. This is very important. As far as I know, you're the only person I know of to do this. It's just my opinion, but without your well thought out use of overhead maps, it's hard for me to see your movies being as successful. Well, perhaps they would still be successful, but I personally think my own brain would struggle trying to visualize these areas. Your work on this automatically takes us there. It puts us there. So, I'm a guy who likes maps and in the movies I've watched and they talk about a certain area, I want to look at it from 10,000 feet, 50,000 feet, and then slowly go down and understand it. It's hard for me to visualize when I've never been there. Thanks for another exhaustive show this morning. I've never mentioned it to you before. I will now. A person I know who runs marathons once told me that he ended up getting lost during a marathon. When he came across a homeless man who asked him what he was doing, his response was, well, uh, I'm in a marathon. As he somehow got back on track and finished, he said that the city did a poor job of plotting out the run for this particular area. And that of all the events he ran in, that particular one was the only one he'd ever got lost. Interesting. How in the heck can you possibly get lost in a marathon being surrounded by thousands of people? Yeah, good question. What else? Oh, regarding this person, I attempted long ago to introduce him to the phenomenon of missing people that continued to go missing and he just wasn't interested. He wasn't even interested in understanding the specific profile to then make a decision to, to form his own conclusion. 
There's also another person, person who I've known for some time, who not only showed zero interest in this subject, but he was moved to crack a joke about as he was setting off to go camping in Yosemite National Park. The joke being, well, I'm going to step outside my tent at 2 o'clock in the morning and look for this thing that's causing these disappearances. Took his Jeep along with his dog into the park and camped out along a running stream for a week. Regarding this attitude, I'll say my piece and be done. I absolutely do not waste even a breath of air with people of this attitude. You can only do so much. If a person's interested, great. I'll continue to communicate until they understand the profile. Of course, deciding for themselves, if they crack a joke, I'll immediately short circuit the entire thing. I won't push. I get it. <laughs> I would say a majority of my friends are just like that. Many of them are former cops. They think everything has to fit in this square box, and if it doesn't, they don't want to know about it. They won't call me a liar, but they won't spend five minutes researching it, seeing if I might be right. But then again, there's a few enlightened souls that are friends that were also ex-cops that are way into this. So I think you have to pre be predestined with a mind that's inquisitive, that is willing to look outside the box that understands life isn't as simple as many think it is. Next one. I've been watching your movies, videos, and I've started on your books. I'm heartbroken by all the suffering many endure in the disappearances of a loved one. I'm also saddened by the loss of your son due to mental illness. My prayers continue to be with you. I'm intrigued by the details of the commonalities you've uncovered in your investigations. I'm a civil engineer by trade, a follower of Yeshua, Jesus, and know the universe is much more complex than we know. I loved your newest movie, Missing 411, The UFO Connection. Each time I watch it, I glean more nuggets of information and connection threads throughout. I have some comments and questions which I'll save for another email. I've also had a few unusual experiences that I'll save for another email as well. But here's a few questions on two of your Bigfoot episodes. In episode 9, it seems many have commented on how Bigfoot walks. Smooth, quiet, almost floating. Have you ever used barefoot shoes? Especially for a couple years or long consistently. I have, and it's a learning experience. It makes a huge difference on how one walks. In those shoes, heel to toe hurts. Instead, a person places their feet more evenly on the forefeet. When you do this, it changes your gait to a much smoother pattern with little or no bobbing of the head. Because of the better ground feel, there's less disturbance on the ground. For some confirmation of this, please watch a YouTube. Also concerning the imprint being deeper than seems reasonable, take my thoughts in several directions. Are they carrying something which in this case, Patty, does their unknown father's parentage have a denser body structure? If they are from elsewhere, what if the gravity is greater than a denser body? Yes, correct. Just because our body isn't that dense doesn't mean their body isn't. What if their bones are twice as thick as ours because their body is 50% larger? Think about that. The smoothness of a Bigfoot walk. The other part of that is when people have seen this just gliding along, Bigfoot's not making any noise. No, no, no leaves are being broken on the ground. No sticks are being broken because they're stepped on it. Just a glide. So, no, I, I don't, I don't understand it. Number two, episode 11, the most recent episode you need to watch. The research on Bigfoot DNA is very eye-opening. I also trust the results due to the thoroughness of your research as you've outlined. The unknown father's DNA is intriguing and stirs more questions. Were the unknown father results compared to each other to see if the various individuals from different locations have a common ancestor? Yes. How would the father's DNA compare to other Bigfoot worldwide? As I stated, we did many samples from two countries and they all matched. If you read this online, I will leave it up to you whether you read the following. I'm familiar with the Bible, specifically Genesis 6-4. There were giants in the earth in those days and also after that. 
when the sons of God came into the daughters of the men and they bare child of them and some same became mighty men which were of old men of renown. This fits the human mother unknown father DNA results. Just saying. There are also some that believe that the angels and demons in the Bible are aliens, whether from off world or interdimensional. Food for thought. Thank you for your dedication. Well, thank you for your email. Now, I don't think I have a copy of it in here, but what am I going to do? Let's see here. In my book, Bigfoot, Wild Man, Giants, from 1680 to 1922, there's several articles in there about giants that are found in farm fields, etc. Giant bones with really strange artifacts, meaning uh, almost like jewelry or pots and things that make no sense. So yeah, they existed. Well, I'm 100% convinced. And there's probably a correlation that we don't understand yet. But it's definitely true that our government doesn't want us to know about it because they've done a lot to try to hide it from us. Now, let's talk about missing 411 law. Law is meant for land, air, and water. Wrote a story about a man, young man, named Michael Mansholt, German, from Germany. Went missing July 18th, 2016 in Malta. He was a student in Oldenburg, Germany. He graduated at the top of his high school class. Not an easy feat. This is Michael. And he applied just prior to graduation and he was accepted as a trainee at Airbus. He was the number one applicant out of hundreds of others. He had an interesting life. Sailed around the world at the age of five. He and his dad, burnt, went to the Yukon in Canada, gold mining. And as a celebration for graduating as he did, Michael and his girlfriend traveled to Germany, or correct that, traveled to Malta on July 8th, 2016 for a pseudo vacation for seven days. The two of them stayed at the Slaima Hotel and visited the island by foot, bus, Uber, and bikes. This is a kind of a picture of the island. This is where the hotel that they stayed at. So they then stayed part of the time near the Dingley Cliffs. And Antonia was her name, had scheduled to a flight to Germany on July 17th. So she left. Mike was there alone for a time. I call it the point of separation. Well, on the 18th, the day after Antonia left, Mike rented a bike and it was scheduled to be returned by the end of the day. And the July 18th day came and went. Mike didn't return the bike. He was gone. Four days later, on July 22nd, Mike had a flight scheduled to Germany. He, did, he wasn't on it. His parents were at the airport ready to pick him up. Wasn't there. His dad reported Michael missing to the Malta police. And they essentially wouldn't do anything. They didn't think it was a big deal. Young kid, eh, you know, he missed the flight so well. Finally, Bert convinced the police on July 26th, which would have been eight days after Michael rented that bike, to start searching the area where he was riding his bike. Well, on the Dingley Cliffs, there's a place called the Magdalena Chapel. Let's see if you can see it here. So you rented the bike in this area. Well, right, on, right near the Magdalena Chapel, right off the cliffs, 
They're searching by air and they find Mike's body. And Dave, kind of sounds like a boring story to me. Doesn't really sound like a 411 story, does it? Hold your taters. I found it interesting. It's right next to a religious chapel, number one. But they find his body at the bottom of a, of a hundred foot cliff. But he's not at the bottom of the cliff. He's under a cutout in the cliff. The bike's next to him. Shoes are not on his feet. And his sunglasses are not on his head. But they're further down the cliff. So he's under an overhang. They go down, they work it like a crime scene. They find out he's missing his GoPro camera. He's missing his wallet and his backpack. And they extensively search that area. And they send the body to autopsy. Remember, a hundred foot fall. The autopsy determines that he has no broken bones. He has no abrasions no scratches, no bruises. And it was the verdict of the coroner in Malta that he didn't fall down the cliff. It was at this time that Burnt, the father, flew to Malta. And he got pretty upset at the Malta police because they weren't handling like it was a possible crime. So Bernd, at his expense, sent the body to Germany and paid for a second autopsy. And what they found in Germany was a little peculiar. And the explanation gave by Malta, maybe, maybe truthful. But the body was missing almost all of the organs and missing the brain. What the Malta police said is that rodents in that area had entered the the body cavity, and had eaten much of the organs. And they also said that because the body had sat in the sun for six to eight days, that much of the body had liquefied. Hmm, okay. But the Malta police declared no foul play. Okay. Now the bike, it had a flat tire but it had no major damage to it at all. No bent frame, no broken things on the bike, nothing that would indicate it fell down the cliff. And the Malta government stated that they couldn't determine the cause of death. Hmm. This is important, folks. So the theories that were rolled out was that Maybe Michael wanted to commit suicide. Now, th these are online theories. Some of the online theories are just complete idiots. So if he was going to commit suicide, how's he going to do it? Is he going to put a bullet in his head? Is he going to hang himself? It would be pretty obvious and easy to figure that one out. Well, he didn't have any brain injuries. Didn't have any bruises on his body. And there were no poisons found in his system. So it wasn't suicide. So maybe it was murder robbery. One big problem. No defensive wounds. No wounds at all. No injuries. Hmm. Maybe he just had an accident and drove off the cliff. Again, no injuries to the body. No injuries to the bike. Maybe he crashed into a car and they threw him and the bike over the cliff. Again, no injuries to the bike, no injuries to the body. When the German government got done with Mike's body, they said that they could not determine the cause of death. Now let's think about Mike for a second. First of all, I've probably read 20 or 30 articles from Germany and Malta about this case. The love that Burnt had for Michael.
palpable. I felt it. Felt very, very similar to the way I think about Ben. You see, Bert knew Michael was special. Top of his class, gets hired by Airbus to go through their training program. Michael had a great future ahead of him. He had a loving girlfriend. His, his life was set. So he was an intellect. Point of separation, his girlfriend leaves. He's found next to a body of water, the ocean. Unknown cause of death. He's on an island. I could go on and on. Cases always bothered me. I don't know what else Bert could have done. Calling the body back to Germany for an autopsy makes a lot of sense. I don't think that there was foul play in the conventional sense that there was robbery or something. But I don't understand what happened here. If he didn't get, if he didn't jump off that cliff, if he didn't fall off that cliff, how did he get to the bottom? There were no easy ways. There was no trails down there. So the police specifically excluded answering that question, which bothers the heck out of me. Michael Mansell, July 18th, 2016, Malta. Next case. Well, it's a U.S. case in Virginia. The man's name was Robert Bobby Fitzgerald, 60 years old. He went missing November 12th, 2012. And he went missing from the Confederate Breastwork Trail in Virginia. Bobby was employed by a sighting company called Ply Gem in Stewart's Draft, Virginia, where he'd been employed for 30 years. His friends described him as quiet, reserved, reliable. He was divorced, had no kids. His friends knew he loved the outdoors and he loved hiking, and he was a resident of Staunton, Virginia. On November 11th, 2012, Bobby went hiking with his girlfriend. And they came back, got off the trail, got in the car. This is Bobby. And Bobby realized he had lost one shirt and his cell phone. Well, weird part, this is a huge coincidence. But there was a North Virginia video production company that was filming at the trailhead when Bobby and his girlfriend came down off the trail. And they actually filmed him around the, their car just as they were leaving. Well, on the 12th, the following day, Bobby drove his 2001 Kia back to the trailhead to look for his property. On the way over there, he visited his mom, who was in a, a conventional old person's home and then went on to the trail. He had, part, he had part of that week off from work, but four days later when he continued to miss work, his employer called the Augusta County Sheriff and reported Bobby missing. His friends said that Bobby knew that trail system inside out and backwards and wouldn't be lost. The deputies drove out and found his Kia parked right at the trailhead. Here's kind of a big map of the area. Washington, D.C. This is Bobby's car parked here. This is Richmond, Virginia. This area through here, this is uh, Monongahela National Forest. So you kind of get a flavor of what it is through here. This is some real wild area. So inside, the deputy that found the car went inside the car and found Bobby's backpack 
with energy bars, extra water, a flashlight, and a raincoat. Well, on November 17th, the sheriff brought in a series of tracking dogs and a helicopter and several ground teams, and they covered 4,500 acres trying to find some evidence of what happened to Bobby. They didn't find anything. Bobby's friends went back week after week. They found nothing. Three years after he disappeared, in July 2015, there was a $50,000 reward posted for any information about what happened to Bobby Fitzgerald. Now, July 16, 2015, the Augusta Sheriff had another massive search, this time with cadaver dogs. They found nothing. The sheriff was asked what he thinks happened to Bobby, and he stated that he thinks the body is somewhere on the mountain. He didn't say why, but he, didn't, he said that he didn't think that there was any foul play. So the mystery, one of the mysteries to me, is why pack a pack with food and water essentials for the trail and leave it in the car. And the only thing I could come up with is that Bobby was in outstanding physical condition. He was known to trail run, another trail runner. So did he decide to leave the backpack in the car and trail run the area looking for his phone and then come back and have that after he was done? Possible. Well, at this time, after 2015, both of his parents were deceased then. His mom never got to see her son again. He was missing in a geographical cluster zone with six other missing people in that area. That's quite a number. And the Appalachian Trail was just 10 miles from where he disappeared. And there's been a whole series of strange disappearances up and down the Appalachian Trail, criminal and otherwise. It's a very unusual area based on the disappearances and the number of them. Well, Bobby went missing on November 12th. On the 11th, he was hiking with his girlfriend, remember? Well, late in the day on November 11th, unbeknownst to Bobby, unbeknownst to his girlfriend, a hiker was coming down the trail and found his phone on the trail and eventually turned it into the sheriff. So Bobby was looking for something that wasn't there. There was never any mention that this person found the shirt that he was missing. Now some people said, well, Bobby's phone was just a cheap phone. They didn't understand why he'd go after it. Well, I don't, I don't think it matters if it's a cheap phone or not. If you're used to that phone and that phone's part of you, and maybe you're on a tight budget, I think you're going to go look for it. I know I would have looked, gone back and looked for it. Doesn't, doesn't seem unusual to me. Now, on the other end of the scale, Bobby was described as quiet and reserved. There was some banter online saying, well, maybe he pulled into the parking lot and he got somebody mad and cut him off and confronted somebody and they got into an argument, killed him, put him in their car and drove him away. Hmm. Possible, I guess. But his demeanor doesn't say that. His demeanor says he's probably more of the personality that would apologize, go into a shell, not confront anybody. So that's hard to understand. But the idea that the backpack was left in the car tells me that he never took it out and walked the trail with it because he probably would have drank some of it and ate some of the food. So he obviously got out of the car. Now, did something happen at the trailhead? I don't know. Obviously, the canines didn't find him on the trail. 
And the cadaver dogs that came in three years later didn't find them either, which is an issue. That three-year-old search should have found something if he was there. So, yeah, Michael Mansell, German, missing in Malta, July 18th, 2016. You have Robert Bobby Fitzgerald, 60 years old, missing November 12th, 2012, in Virginia. Now, Michael was only 17. How did he get under an overhang on a cliff when there were no drag marks? There were no footsteps. There was nothing showing that he pulled himself up into that position. Very confusing case. But those are our two cases for today. Remember, read the comments under, the, under your screen. Make sure you subscribe. You can follow me on Twitter, uh, David Politis at Can-Am Missing. Uh, I'm also on Truth Social. And you can follow me right here by subscribing to the Can-Am Missing Project on YouTube. Thank you. Thank you for everything you've done for me and for missing people. Go out and do something generous for somebody you don't know. Help someone who's fallen. Open the door for somebody at the store. Be a good person. And lastly, remember to leave a review for the movie. Thanks again. Politis out.